May is Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. It's an opportunity to reflect on the generations of Asian Americans who have enriched America's history and celebrate the nearly 20 million Asian American individuals who are instrumental to our country's future success. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast from the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hetterley with AHA Communications. In this podcast, Joy Lewis, AHA Senior Vice President of Health Equity Strategies and Executive Director of the Institute for Diversity and Health Equity, is joined by Janet A. Liang, Executive Vice President, Group President, and Chief Operating Officer for Care Delivery with Kaiser Permanente, to discuss her experience as an Asian American healthcare leader, challenges within the Asian American community, and what this month means to her. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Janet, for speaking with me today. It's it's really great to be in conversation with you. To get us started, Janet, can you share a little bit more about yourself and your role at Kaiser Permanente? I mean, I know a little bit about that as a former KPR myself, but um, if you can share with our audience a little bit more about, about you, that would be great. Well, Joy, first, good morning, and thank you for um, inviting me to speak with you today on a really uh, important topic here uh, for healthcare in our country. And I also want to just thank you for your leadership and representing America's hospitals in, in your legislative activity and for your support of the Institute for Diversity and Health Equity, uh, where you've been a speaker many, a t- many, many times. So I um, really appreciate seeing you there and also being with you here today. I've had the, this, the pleasure of a 30-year career in integrated care and coverage organizations that, uh, for me, really align with my personal values of social health, prevention, and um, community stewardship in the work that we do to really promote health and save lives. And uh, for me, it's been uh, just amazing to be at an organization here at Kaiser Permanente to be able to do that on, on a national scale. I am officially the group president for the California markets, which has over 9 million members and over 150,000 employees and 20,000 physicians. I also have responsibility for our national care delivery organization. And so I spend a lot of my time working on and advancing innovation in healthcare, clinical transformation, and also the past two years really directing most of our COVID response. So clearly you're wearing multiple hats, Janet, and um, juggling it all really well. You mentioned COVID, and so I'm just going to pick up on that and ask you a little bit about your experience as an Asian American healthcare leader. And if you can do a look back on the pandemic, how has that changed your experience, if any? You know, I think with COVID, the whole topic of racism and how it affects health and health care and health status really became transparent. We saw that people who were disproportionately impacted by either becoming infected with COVID, died from COVID, and those who had access to vaccines were people of black or brown um, backgrounds and also people from more vulnerable communities where there was a higher percentage of poverty or lower income. I think a, a takeaway from that was that we were willing as a country and as a healthcare system to talk about those statistics, right? To talk about the mistrust in the healthcare system and why people were hesitant to seek care. And I think that was a breakthrough. And my hope is that we can continue in our, you know, in our industry and in our country talking about other types of health outcomes that both from prevention to um, disease states that are, that would suggest to you that there is an equity in healthcare. And because we know in our industry that there, that, that does exist. And transparency is really important in motivating us to and encouraging us to really do something about it in the same way that we saw our willingness to do it during COVID. Thanks for that, Janet. And you just um, 
you know, kind of brought to the forefront the, this notion that health disparities are not new. Granted, COVID has elevated awareness about them. So can you expand on that a little bit more and speak more broadly to some of the health challenges that Asian Americans face across this country? I think the first is that, um, you know, it's convenient to use the category of Asian Pacific Islander, but that sort of lumping everybody into one category can lead to complacency when you're thinking about genetics, socioeconomic and cultural beliefs, because there are over 40 countries represented in the um, API community. And there are over 20 languages alone spoken by you know, Asian Pacific Islanders. And so I think the first thing I would say is the challenge is to say that it's not one group or one race when you talk about API. The second is to recognize that there are some unique health challenges and disparities, particularly uh, when you look at the immigration history and um, the um, people who have recently arrived into the country. You see higher rates of chronic hepatitis B, and you also see tuberculosis at 33 times um, the rate of in Asian Americans than in non-Hispanic white populations. You know, so I do think that more has to be done to recognize the diversity within API and that there are unique factors that come from both the immigration history as well as genetics within uh, the population. Thanks for that very comprehensive answer, uh, Janet. And you signaled that you know, the Asian American population continues to grow. And, and there are many parts in this country, including where you are there out in California, where Asian Americans make up the largest minority ethnic racial group. But at the same time, we know that in healthcare, Asian Americans exceed their share of the population in, in what we call high contact essential occupations. So physicians, surgeons, nurses, therapists, but we don't necessarily see the, this conversion or the translation of a high percentage of Asian Americans in, in C-suite or even in CEO roles within our hospitals and health systems. But one of the things we do know is that having diversity of thought and diverse representation at the decision-making table absolutely results in better decisions on behalf of the patients and communities that we serve. And so I guess one question I would have for you is what do you see as some strategies to improve diversity and representation and to really create more executive leadership opportunities for Asian American healthcare leaders like yourself? Joy, it's a, it's a great question. It's not unique to Asian Americans in advancing in healthcare or in other industries to the C-suite. In fact, in healthcare, we see approximately 6% of the hospital C-suite is Asian or Asian Pacific Islander. And uh, when you look at the uh, overall population, it's about 11% non-white. I'm happy to say that Kaiser Permanente, that number is 31%. Uh, so 31% of our executives are minorities. And when you look at that compared to our um, manager population, our 53% of our managers are members of minority groups. So I think we we're doing a good job. And I think there's always room to improve and to get better uh, as we look at how people advance in an organization. A couple of things that we do and we've done it for quite some time, is to ensure that we have management development programs that, and we're, and we're paying attention to the populations that enter into these programs. So you have to start pretty early as you look at your pipeline. And what, what we typically see is that if you're not inviting people to ensure that there's a good balance in a representation within your development programs, you tend to have, for whatever reason, if it's nominated by leadership that is primarily white, you tend to see people who are nominated that are primarily white. 
So you have to have ways to identify minority candidates and to ensure that the cohorts and the classes that go through all your development programs have a good mix of representation of your central, your community or your workforce. So that's, that's essential in the early times in your career. And then you have to have good mentorship programs. You have to have sponsors within the organization. A lot of times it happens informally for diverse individuals. And what you want to try to do is make those programs a little bit more formal so that it's not about individuals who who reach out, but that you're ensuring that there is a program which helps to identify diverse leaders who are looking for mentors and sponsors. So those two things combine are really important in cultivating your early managers, directors, right, executive directors on the path to the C-suite. And then um, we also have executive programs. So all along the way, you want to be looking at the statistics. And that's why I'm a big fan of transparency and numbers. I want to see 50%, 60% of each cohort and in at every level representing um, our population. Well, kudos to you and Kaiser Permanente on uh, being so intentional around ensuring that your pipeline strategy um, reflects diversity. And, 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 and solid representation from across different racial and ethnic groups. I can't say I'm surprised. I'm actually the, the graduate. I am a proud graduate of the strategic leadership program. <laughs> so um, I've benefited from that myself. Since we're in community and we're having this conversation to honor Asian Pacific Islander Month, I think it's fitting that we close with a question about what exactly, what does Asian Pacific Islander Month mean to you? Well, I want to say every month is Asian Pacific Islander Month. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> for me at least, right? Uh, right, and right. I think it's nice to bring a focus on a month so that we can come together and celebrate our cultural heritage and to share that heritage and uniqueness with other communities and peoples. But it is, for me, a year-round effort to ensure that Asian Pacific Islanders, just like all unrepresented communities, have an opportunity to ensure that their voices are heard, that our unique needs are met, and that we're safe from discrimination and prejudice uh, so that we can lead fulfilling lives. Without safety, psychological safety, a sense of equal opportunity, economic and to access to health, you really can't achieve total health in your life for yourself and your family. And without your health, it's hard to to, um, really focus on other aspects of what we would consider just, you know, a thriving family and um, social well-being in our community. So health is critical. It's a necessary component to happiness and fulfillment in society. I couldn't agree more, Janet, and that's a really great way to uh, wrap up our, our, our time together. Health has to be our cause and health has to be our goal for all of us. So thank you again for joining me today. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us today. Great. Thank you so much, Joy.